I, 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 I hear people. I hear people. Rah, rah. This is awesome. Cheering and all kinds of stuff. How's everybody doing? If I sound a little rough, it's because I think I've had a couple days of like cedar pollen fevery stuff. I, I laid around and did a whole bunch of nothing. But uh, how are you? Just fine. How are you? Good. At least one of us should be just fine. Uh, I'm Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, Don Baker. Yay! And good to be uh, here. we are part of uh, the Atheist Community of Austin, the Atheist Experience Network. Uh, a couple of quick announcements to get out of the way before we uh, <clears throat> dig in on today's topic and then get to calls. Uh, if you're watching live on YouTube, I've just been told that there's product stuff there that you can get and there's membership discount and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, we had a, the ACA had a membership meeting yesterday to approve uh, one quick uh, bylaw change. There's going to be more of that coming. There's a board meeting this Tuesday that's open to the board and to members here at the Atheist Community of Austin. If you are not in the Austin area, well, come on down and visit sometime because this is, you know, cool place. We do, we do cool stuff. Austin's a good town. Uh, but if you are down here and you haven't come by, why not? The Atheist Community of Austin is sponsor or has the Atheist Free Thought Library right here. And while we had a toilet emergency in the last <laughs> week or so, that's all resolved. There's a working toilet down at the end of the hall there. Um, and, and it smells great and it's clean. Um, yeah, we had some some tree uh, roots grew through the sewer lines. Oh, fun. And clogged them. And this is an old building, so it's like right. cement sewer and drains and everything else. Uh it became kind of a deal. We also have a porta potty out back that, that is Just still out there. Just in case. Huh? Just in case there's anything wrong. <laughs> but yeah, things are going well. The building's open pretty much seven days a week from around 11 to 9 or so. Uh, if you ever get to the building and there's nobody here, it's because this is primarily a volunteer-run organization and occasionally things happen. And so there's a number up uh, by the door that you can call. And if, you know, basically, if you let us know you're going to be here, we can try and do something. But one question that comes in all the time is, hey, I'm going to be in Austin on this week in April, who's gonna be on the show and how do I get tickets? And I thought it was long past time to actually address those questions. Well, I'll sell them tickets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Number one, I, can't, I have no clue who's gonna be on the show in April. Uh, there was a minute there where we weren't sure who was gonna be on the show today. <laughs> That's right. But. Uh, so we try and post a schedule. If you go to atheist-experience.com, there's a schedule up there that is as up-to-date as anybody here knows, uh, generally speaking. As far as tickets, we don't require tickets. Uh, now, sometimes that means there's, I don't know, it looks like there's 20-some-odd people on the other side of the glass, and I know there's people out back. Basically, the attendance at the building on Sundays for Atheist Experience is going to range anywhere from 40-50-ish to 140-50-ish. It's been lower than that a few times. It, it's, it, it drops on occasion. It depends on what's going on, how many people oh, are in town. West, yeah. yeah, and uh, we have parkings at a premium. You have to park on the street and around the corner and all that stuff. But you don't need a ticket. And if you're only coming, you know, the one weekend and you're just desperately hoping that, you know, it's this is the weekend that Dawn's on or that Jenna's on or that whoever's on, uh, we're probably not going to change the schedule just to fit your travel plans. <laughs> but, you know, if you make a sizable donation to the atheist community to Austin, that could happen. <laughs> right. So tickets for the show with the hosts of your choice are currently running at about what? We'll say five thousand dollars. <laughs> five thousand dollar donation. You show up on a Sunday. You can pick the hosts from the pool of available hosts. I, yeah. I'm mostly joking. I, I don't know. I, I couldn't make that uh, decision. And we get a surprising yeah. number of out of towners, and I think it's really awesome. Yeah. On the other side of the glass, if you're not from Austin, raise your hand. Wow. Yeah, that's like about a third, a third. of them. Yeah. Wow. Hey, we came up with the same approximation. A third. Hey. Clearly, we're telling the we're, truth. We're, we're correct. Uh, or we rehearsed that. <laughs> Uh, a couple quick notes in addition to the uh, products and stuff on YouTube. Th there's uh, Jim Barrows actually was was ready to step in just in case Don couldn't make it today, but he also guest hosted on Nonprofits this past week, and there's a new episode of Nonprofits that's going up. And as a reminder, we are sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, which is a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of religion and government. As such, we uh, do not advocate for or against political candidates or even parties specifically. And so while we're entering 2020, welcome to 2020, where our vision is normal, if not a little skewed. Uh, we're going to get questions on political topics on occasion, and we can, in fact, address political topics and give our opinions on those things. But what we can't do is endorse or promote or tell people how to vote or do anything along those lines. And so because today... Because today's topic is going to come 
it's it's going to touch on that in a way where somebody's going to be like, oh, that's what they're doing. That's not what we're doing. <laughs> but it's worth mentioning uh, because you have kind of a, a, a topic. Does this count as a failure? Uh, I didn't particularly count it as a failure. But, oh, let's uh, it, count it. it. It sort of is. Let's, let's count it, it as is. a failure. <laughs> the, the religious, what's it, what, how did you title it? I titled it God's Anointed Leaders. God's Anointed Leaders. Yep. Tell us, tell us, Don, tell us all about God's anointed leaders. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, part of my reason for doing this is that uh, g- former governor, Texas governor Rick Perry was in the news on... Uh, you mean the former secretary of energy? Uh, cur- current, right? Oh, no, no. No foreign? Okay. Anyway, uh, he was the governor of Texas and uh, he was on Fox and Friends November 24th and said that Trump was the chosen one. He said, if you are a believing Christian, you understand God's plan for the people who rule and judge over us on this planet in in our government. And uh, this was an episode of Fawning that uh, Rick Perry did. Franklin Graham also uh, got into the mix. He's the son of uh, famous evangelical minister Billy Graham. He had an interview with Eric Metaxas, a Salem radio network uh, talk show host on November 21st. Uh, Metaxas says, uh, what do you think of what's happening right now? I mean, it's a very bizarre situation to be living in a country where some people seem to exist to undermine the president of the United States. It's just a bizarre time for most Americans. Graham says, well, I believe it's a demonic power that is trying. Metaxas says, I would disagree. It's not almost demonic. You know, and I know at the heart, it's a spiritual battle. So it's a spiritual battle over over the president and the uh, impeachment. Um, of course, the irony is that Trump is a proven terrible leader and is on it has is on his way to being impeached. Uh, we'll see what happens there. And maybe was this God's plan all along? Well, some people think so. A poll asked all uh, if all presidents are anointed by God. A recent poll. While the second asked if Trump was specifically anointed by God to win the 2016 election. In the sample, 21.4 believed that Trump was specifically anointed by God to be president, but that figure increases among groups who believe in modern day prophets and a God who is active in the daily affairs of the world. 21.4% of what? Of Of all the people participating in the survey. But did they specifically target Christians or evangelicals or? I think for these surveys, they try for a broad spectrum and then they subdivide it. Okay, because that seems kind of low to me because there's a specific verse. Which we'll get to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Slightly more white evangelicals, 29% agree that Trump was anointed by God, but among the white Pentecostals like Paula White, that figure shot up to 53%. So there's, there's the numbers that maybe you're looking for. In the Bible, uh, we have Romans 13, 1 through 2, and we have Daniel 2, 21. I'll read the Romans one. Every person is to be in subject subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whatever, whoever resists authority uh, has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnations upon themselves. Yeah, it's essentially, it's a weird verse. And and what strikes me is that there weren't that, you know, you would think that among Christians who perhaps knew their Bible, um, that I would would have expected the numbers to be slightly higher. And then I remembered, oh, most of them don't know their Bible. (laughs) Right. Uh, So it makes sense (laughs) that it was less than 50% because that particular passage essentially establishes um, that all leaders are appointed by God. This gets, also gets back to God has a plan and everything mm-hmm, goes according mm-hmm. to God's plan. So all of your leaders are appointed by God, which means that no revolution or revolt could ever be godly, which means America was founded... And, in, until it was successful. Yeah. <laughs> America wasn't founded as a godly nation. It was a revolt against uh, England. And since that was the leader that was appointed by God, the <laughs> founders of America were clearly not doing what the Bible said, you yeah. know, and, and, and obeying their appointed leaders. So it's really, there's a lot of strangeness in this. Yes, there is. There is. There's, there's more Bible quotes that are, that are kind of similar in spirit. And of course, there's lots of problems here. Uh, clearly, this is a manipulation mechanism meant to excuse evil. 
If you are against the evils of your current administration, you are pitting yourself against God, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Republicans tout that uh, they are the anointed by God thing when their candidate is in power, but remember that Obama was a Muslim from Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, so if the verse is true... That. You didn't hear this thing then. Yeah. <laughs> if the verse is true, then Trump is God's appointed and Obama was uh -huh. God's appointed. Right. And Bush Clinton, Jr. was God's Clinton, appointed. Clinton was oh, God's yeah, appointed. They've all been God's appointed. Right. Which, you know... God's got some issues if he's, you know, pointing people with diametrically opposed. But, he, you know, right. he knows better than us, so maybe it's what needs to happen. And God also chose Hitler, Pol Pot, Stalin, Lenin, Kim Jong-un, Putin, and all the murderous evil leaders that have ever been. He chose them. And that means you can't blame Russian dictators on atheism because God, God chose them instead. Yep. <laughs> and, and it gets worse than that if you go to, you know, if God, having foreknowledge of the universe could have made a different universe, then that means God specifically chose to make this universe and everything that happens within it. The best of all possible worlds. Which means you don't have free will in any sense under that model, because God picked the universe in which, you know, on, on this date and I, I would be sitting here having this conversation, right. saying these things, <laughs> rather than choosing to create a universe where I remained a Christian or where, you know, somebody else won an election. These were all choices that God made before the beginning to say, this is the way I wanted to plan out. And if that's not what happened, then your God can't be a reliable purveyor of prophecy because if the universe isn't playing out exactly as he said it to, uh, then what good is a prediction? Good point. Good point. I like that. I predict that somebody who's currently on hold will hang up before dawn is finished. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. I'm almost done. Uh, ultimately, this sort of God belief uh, makes Christianity anti-democratic. And um, there were never any elections in the Bible, so it's kind of a foreign concept there. It's just mindless obedience, serving a mass murdering uh, God. Um, Christianity is therefore uh, actively kind of undermining the United States and clearly deserves no... Tax, tax reference or tax breaks or these sorts of things. It's, uh, you know, anti-American anti as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, to be clear, though, um, that would be Christianity if it were actually being practiced and understood <laughs> as these verses suggest. Right. By and large, as long as you've got cafeteria Christians who, you know, are like, okay, I'm okay with the gays as long as, you know, they keep it to themselves right. or whatever. We'll just pretend there's no slavery in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's be Christianity and many other religions as well have survived because of people's ability to retcon their religion to say, oh, well, this is the way it was back then, or ignore that it was this way back then, and say, uh, this is what that means, or this is how mm. I'm going to interpret it. Right, spin it, spin it for what Our leaders are appointed by God right up until the point where I disagree with the leader, <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's, you know, he's the Antichrist. And why should you vote? Uh, if God, if you believe that God chooses leaders, then why in the world would you go vote? At best, you're wasting your time. At worst, you're going to piss him off. And he'll torture you. Unless you're voting for who God wants you to vote for. <laughs> yeah, are, are you suggesting, Don, that a, a, a deity-driven, top-down religious structure that is authoritarian, where the books that support it, God has gone through and handpicked his leaders from Moses and Noah and, you know, David and all of these, is somehow not in favor of democracy? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, are there any verses at all about voting? Not that I know of. Hmm. It's almost like democracy was a foreign concept at the That's time right. this stuff was it's written. demonic, probably. Yeah. It was Greek. It was a little too Greek for them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Those Greeks. <laughs> All right. Well, instead, uh, instead, uh, spend election day in church and mindlessly worshiping your invisible mass murderer, mass murderer who will choose your leader instead of you. Uh, Although part of the problem is that if you spend election day in church, quite often there's voting booths. There. Oh no! <laughs> so much for that. Well, that's it for this this topic. Let's go ahead and take some calls. Sure. Um, we're going to start off with Joe in New York. You're on with Don and Matt. I was on this show for this is the pet. This is the third time in in a row. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I want to talk about atheist depravity. Oh, um, boy. Is there, why would you call it atheist depravity? What, what, what are you calling depravity? And why is it in any way tied to atheist? Well, if I, if I you know, I'm, I was going to give a bunch of examples. Well, let's start with um, one. Choose your best one. I'm, well, obvious, obviously the best one is, you know, um, Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong and uh, Pol Pot um, killing millions and millions. Yeah, but they were, they were anointed by God, right? <laughs> I can't. So it was God's I, fault. Uh, but, well, so, so hang on. Um, we're, we're talking about depravity. Um, the fact that someone is an atheist and does something that's bad doesn't mean that they're doing something bad because they are an atheist or because of atheism. Right? Because otherwise, it may just be that the problem is men. Like everybody you listed is a man. Pretty much all serial killers are men. There's a couple of exceptions. But once we, you know, make adjustments for that, maybe it's just being genetically, um, you know, XY chromosome type of thing uh, of that stereotypical mustachioed evil villain. Maybe men are just the problem and it's not anything to do with an ideology. And I'm using men kind of in the loose thing. Yeah, so, I, I feel so that starting a example. I feel that starting a discussion about gender identity and expression with you is not going to be very productive. So, what's, so, what's so your connect, depravity example that is tied to atheism? Yeah, connect the dots for us. Well, um, you know, li li the lifestyles of uh, people in America too. Um, people like in America are pre predominantly atheist. I, I, all I want, well, all I want, Joe, is. Give us an example of what you mean by depravity and show how it is linked to necessarily atheism. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing that. I, uh, no, you're not, but let's, let's start. I had friends in college who were atheists. Okay. And they had promiscuous sex with women. Which, you know, you wouldn't find any religious people doing that because they wait till marriage. Oh, all religious and, uh, people, all religious people, first of all, all religious people don't wait till marriage. Uh, I was religious and had sex before marriage. Second of all, what you're describing is depravity. You need to make a case for why two people having consensual sex is somehow depraved. It's not necessarily two people having sex. It's, it's somebody who has sex with somebody and then moves on to have sex with their next conquest. And, and, and that's, uh, no, no, no. I, I would agree with you that viewing sex as a conquest or tr transactional is definitely problematic. There are character flaws in people who are, are, you know, engaged in those sorts of serial relationships. But if we're talking about somebody who just has sex with someone and then goes on and has sex with somebody else, there's nothing, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> what, what's funny? Uh, I didn't think I was going to have to argue that point with you. Well, th uh, then, then you really screwed up because you're going to. See, here's the thing, Joe, is that you seem to have a view of things that are depraved. And, and here in the call screener's notes, it says, according to you, there's been research that divorce, cannibalism, and drunkenness are caused by atheism. Is that what you're calling about? Uh, some, I mean, I, I wouldn't say all of it is caused by atheism, but I'd say there's a lot of it. Did, did you know that the divorce rates among Christians is higher than, than among atheists? Uh, no, I, d I didn't know that. Um, you're, you're welcome to write the uh, uh, Atheist Experience uh, TV show, and, and uh, I'd be glad to give you a citation for that. The, the, um, issue, the issue here, Joe, is that you, you called in, and, and you seem to have this view that atheism causes a lot of bad behavior. And yet... Okay. And, and yet the sorts of things that you that that you and I might agree are bad behavior 
aren't tied to atheism in any demonstrable way, and yet I would argue that some of the things that you and I would agree are bad behavior are clearly supported by religious tomes and doctrines and, and things like that. So, I mean, would you agree with me that slavery is a problem, that it's, that it's immoral? Uh, yes, yes. And yet, I don't know what your religion is. Are, are you a Bible-believing Christian at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I am. And, and you're aware that the Bible explicitly supports and endorses slavery, right? I am, yes. And then why the fuck are we having any conversation about this? You're calling in to say that there's these, de these depraved things that are caused by atheism. And the one thing that we know you and I agree on is supported and endorsed by the book that you're advocating for. Yeah, except, okay, I understand what the Bible's talking about when it talks about slavery. Do you? It's, it's people... Owning other people as property. Yeah, who enslave people that are that themselves were depraved. Oh, they, were uh, they so, deserved it. Well, hang on. So, are you saying that that's morally permissible to own other people's property as long as they're depraved? It was kind of like a uh, like a, a beat them into submission type of thing. Yeah. Um, Are you saying beating people into submission is a good thing? How about blaming the victim? No, no, no. But these particular people, these tribal people or whatever, they yeah. were, um, they were, uh, you know, cannibals and... Uh, oh, um, what, what evidence do you have for this? They weren't... Is this is this what? just a bullshit well, rationalization? Hey, well, or what, just... what, what difference does it make? <laughs> are, are, are you saying that it's okay to enslave people as long as you view them as depraved? It it may be. I mean, I I'm I'm open to it. Okay, I think that's a very depraved outlook. I'd like to enslave you now. Are you open to that? <laughs> Laugh all you want. Yeah, but I, but I haven't shown you that I'm depraved. Yes, you are, because you're advocating for owning people as property and beating people into submission as long as you're convinced that what they're doing is depraved and the things that you listed as depravity. Um, uh, which is something you're going to label as promiscuity, isn't something that is demonstrably a problem. So because I've had multiple sexual partners outside of marriage, you consider me depraved, and now I'm concerned that you think it would be okay to enslave me or beat me into submission. No, 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 no. I, I, I mean... Then you should go off and think about this and call in some other time with something that's remotely fucking relevant. But, all right, where are we going next? Got oh, any preference? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. We'll start with Matt in Michigan. Thanks for waiting. You're on with Don and Matt. And Matt. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Matt. Not bad. Hi. Uh, okay, so last time I called in, uh, we had a brief interaction, and you suggested that I do a little reading on, on epistemology. Yeah. And then, uh, so I did that, and then I had some questions for you as it relates to applying your epistemology to the study of the New Testament. Okay. Okay, so uh, as I understood it from the, from the brief, you know, amount of reading that I did, that there are, like, different divisions of epistemology, including uh, a priori, like, understanding, like, rational um, inductive reasoning, and also a posteriori, which is, like, scientific, like, repeatable kind of um, demonstrations where you can learn by experience. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. All right, good. So last time I called also, you mentioned that it would be, uh, I, so I think we were a little bit, um, you were talking past each other a little bit because I was getting hung up on the idea of like, calling the resurrection a miracle and that implying causation, I think, was causing a little bit of confusion. And so um, now I would like to um, try to understand what kind of epistemology like how you came to the conclusion that the New Testament is not trustworthy or that the resurrection didn't happen, like what, how you applied your epistemology to that subject. So I haven't reached the conclusion that a resurrection didn't happen, 
my position is that... What makes you think that it is incredible? Because we have a claim that we cannot investigate. That is from a source that we cannot investigate or interrogate or identify. And the claim is of an extraordinary nature. And the evidence supporting it, which is basically just claims and anecdotal, is not extraordinary. And so there needs to be a degree of quality and quantity of evidence that is commensurate to the degree of extraordinariness of the claim. For example, if somebody says, hey, I got a new puppy, that's, a, that's a, an especially mundane claim because I am already aware and can confirm that dogs exist and puppies exist and people hold them as pets. I've had puppies myself. Other people I know have had puppies, etc. If somebody says I have, we'll go with the, you know, the common example, an invisible pink unicorn. Now the nature of the claim is such that I would need more evidence than merely accepting their word for it. And by the way, even just accepting somebody's word that they got a new puppy isn't confirmation that it's true. It is about saying, I'm willing to accept that based on this claim alone. I'm not willing to accept that somebody rose from the dead and is in fact divine and performed miracles just because somebody said so. Okay, and so as it pertains, so you, you mentioned last time that it would be fine for the resurrection to happen once at a fixed point in the past. Do you still believe that? Because I, I was kind of like confused because it seemed as though you were asking for a posterior um, evidence. Like, well, I, I am, I the, am, but so let's imagine for a second that a r resurrection occurred at some point in the past. Mm -hmm. That alone doesn't mean that you cannot get enough evidence to confirm it. It, it may be that the nature of the claim and its distance in the past forever prevents us from being able to reasonably confirm it, but that's not necessarily the case. So I wasn't, I, the point of what I was saying was, it's not necessarily impossible that merely putting something in the past or in the distant past makes it untestable. It may be other things about the claim that make it untestable. So the thing that would make it untestable to you would be the fact that it's a supernatural claim, right? Like, would you say I that, don't, that, that? No, 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 because I don't know if it's a supernatural claim or not. I, so you might want to watch the debate that I did with Mike Lacona because he basically spent the whole time arguing that reality apparently has a supernatural component and this leans credence to the resurrection. And my point was... I don't have sufficient evidence to conclude that a resurrection in fact occurred. How, if I did, even if I were to accept, okay, Jesus was dead and then Jesus was alive. The how that happened, I still would have no idea. And whether or not it was supernatural or, you know, an incredibly advanced technology or whether there's a, an, an utterly mundane explanation for it, uh, I don't know. It's, I'm not ruling something out because it's supernatural. The fact that people are asserting a supernatural cause for something makes it, puts it into the realm of t untestable or possibly even, even more untestable than it would be in a regular s circumstances. Like, okay. how, do I tell, okay. how do I tell whether or not George Washington refused to tell a lie about cutting down a cherry tree? Uh, well, I believe that would be, um, you know, that would be historical in investigation, which would require abductive reasoning. Yeah. And so w when we do that, do we think that George Washington actually cut down a cherry tree and refused to tell a lie about it? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, it would determine, it would be, for me anyway, it would be determined by like who the witnesses were, right. what their proximity, you know, was to the... To the, you know, to the events. And, and, yeah, I would uh, agree. And, and also, I would argue that we have really good reason to think that that, that event, those events did not actually occur. Um, and I know some people have, have done some research showing um, how this story was likely invented afterwards. Um, it doesn't matter that much to me because maybe even if George Washington did chop down a cherry tree and then said, I, I refuse to tell a lie, even though it's extraordinary and it's mythic hero-making type stuff that we would normally look at and go, yeah, that shit didn't happen. Uh, even if it did, it doesn't matter that much to me. It, the, the issue here is people are now saying that the reports of a resurrection that we cannot confirm or investigate are sufficient to base their entire view of reality 
and their lives around. That's not just, yeah, I'm kind of convinced. I, I don't view religious claims in the same ballpark as, eh, maybe George Washington didn't tell a lie, maybe he did, who knows. <clears throat> it, it's something more significant than that. So the nature of the claim and its impact on the world, all of those things have to be considered. So yes, what, I agree completely. if I told you that um, last week my uh, uncle had a heart attack, was on the table, died, no brain waves, no pulse, and then a day later revived and walked out of the hospital on his own, would you believe that? Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe not. It would kind of depend. You know, it would depend. I mean, since since I'm so close to the event, that would be kind of a situation where I'd be able to actually go and speak to him. Yeah, but what yeah, if, so what if you couldn't? Kind of be like a little bit different. What if you well, couldn't investigate at all beyond my story? Well, then I would so I would apply the like standard methods of investigating history. So I would look at the the quality, the number of uh, witnesses, what they had to lose by saying that it was true, or what they had to gain by lying about it. You know, if it didn't actually happen, and like what their worldview was, and sort of the external relevant factors uh, surrounding the situation to make me determine like. Would it be, is, do you know your uncle very well? Like, is he somebody you spent a lot of time with? So there's no way you could be tricked if it was actually somebody else appearing. Yeah. And what, uh, what if... It's like a polysensory kind of a thing where he actually, you actually could like physically touch him and sit with him and talk with him and things of those nature. Like, what, it was, what if... It all, it I, I get it. I get it, Matt. But what if instead of me telling you this story, somebody else that you've never met and don't know told you my story? And now you can't invest. Uh, you can't talk. To, close to you. you can't. Well, you can't talk yeah. to me. You can't talk to them. You don't even know who the story is coming from. Well, I mean, I, that's not really necessarily the case. It is absolutely the case. It is absolutely the. It is absolutely the case with the gospel accounts. With well, the gospel, yes, I agree that the gospels they are they are not they are anonymous. I agree with that. But, right. So um, if we toss out the, if we toss out the gospel accounts, what's left? Well, the thing is, I wouldn't necessarily need to necessarily know. I mean, if there was a sufficient number and quality of witnesses, then I wouldn't. Well, what, what, is, what is a sufficient number and quality of witnesses for a resurrection? And how does Christianity so even me, come close to that? Okay, well, so for me, I, I see that religious people tend to be very focused on eternity. You know, they have, you know, while they may suffer uh, in this life for something that they believe, they will, they will never do something to willfully... Uh, interrupt their ability to, you know, go to their version of heaven. Like regardless that's of that's heaven absolute. Is. That is absolute bullshit. That is that is the one of the most bullshit things anybody's ever said. Have you ever told a lie? M my point is, they're not going to d to say something is true, knowing that it is false. If they're a devout religious person, they're not going to. So religious people don't story. lie. Religious people don't lie is that's what you're what saying. No, not at all. That's not what I'm saying. You, you just saying said that. they would not knowingly t say something that There's wasn't true. a whole true. category of lies called pious no. fraud. But, but I'm not <laughs> trying to suggest that they would never tell a lie in general. I'm saying that I do not believe that a religious person would knowingly invent a story that would that would offend the God that they still believe in on purpose. Really? Right. So that's kind of a, a little bit different. So, like, if I if I lie to my wife, there's like, a lot of people in our audience. You don't, their you, heads. you don't think that, you don't <laughs> think that lying to your wife offends God? No, I'm sure that it does. I'm okay, sure that it does. But my, and you don't my think point is, you don't think that in the entire history. And by the way, you're saying religious people. I'm assuming you're just talking about Christians. No, I, my point is. So no Muslim is, would ever lie in a way that would defend his God. Not intentionally. So my thing is, he may tell that a is, lie, right? In, in, okay. Hold on. Can I finish? No. Okay, no, actually, you lie. can't. So this, this is a sticking point, Matt, because essentially, and, and I want to make sure I understand this. You're asserting that a sincere religious believer for any religion would never knowingly lie about that religion. I'm saying that a devout religious person, right, if they knew that inventing a story, right, so if they, if they knew that inventing a story would cause them to, for sure, not gain their eternity, they would not go out of their way to invent and propagate that story. How yeah, about, yes, how about I'm definitely going to go to heaven. How about if they, they if they invented a lie that caused there to be more believers and embellishment? 
like Eusebius. Okay, but if they, if the people who are inventing the story knew that by inventing the story they were robbing themselves of an opportunity at Yeah, but if you get more believers, that then then that's yeah. good for God, right? Like, so but, but, I know, find this. Why would they want to do that? Why would why, they why want? Why would they want what, to oh, the story that they would knowingly be offending the God that they still believe in? Is my point. Um, so it's not as though not no, like stop. an act of. Okay. What you're doing is such a mix of absolute fallacies and absurdities that it's been difficult to, to latch on to it because essentially in here somewhere is the no true Scotsman fallacy that no true believer would ever knowingly lie in a way that might jeopardize their own salvation. But you also have this notion that if they knew that it was going to risk their salvation, they wouldn't do it. But under Christianity, you don't know that. No one knows but God who is or isn't saved, and God saves who he, who he will and who he won't. And so if we can't even agree on what the criteria for salvation are or whether or not salvation can be lost because there are people who hold to once save, always save, if you cannot even get to a doctrine that is agreement, then what you have is a state of confusion where somebody would, would like Eusebius, who I would recommend you look into, knowingly commit a pious fraud because the ends leading more people to Christ and to truth and to salvation would justify the means in the same way that a Christian mother like Andrea Yates would drown her children in order to, under her theology, guarantee their ascent to heaven even if it meant damning her. And you seem to think that people who, even under your religious doctrine, are fallen creatures who are constantly subjected to sin would somehow never be dishonest about something when it comes to, the, when it comes to their salvation or putting their salvation at risk. And further, as the final note on this, I'm not asserting that the gospel authors were either true believers or lying. People can in fact be wrong and not lying. You don't have to go to they told a lie and were willing to die. That is a fallacy. Plenty of people have said things that weren't true and were willing to die for that because they sincerely believed it and they were sincerely wrong. None of this okay. gets to Therefore, a resurrection is plausible. Well, I, I'm aware of that, so I, I'm just trying to I'm, I'm trying to explain my side of the story. So I, I'm suggesting that, like, so Paul is a good example, or Peter, or James. James being Jesus' half brother. Okay, and he was the lead apostle of the Jerusalem Church. Yeah, and I, Voldemort. I'm saying what I was saying. And Voldemort was a Death Eater. Okay, but James is actually recorded in Josephus as having as having been martyred around 62 A.D. Uh, so it's like he's, he's corroborated in an external source. But my the, the point in what there, I was there's a James referenced in Josephus, it. but Josephus is also yeah, there's also a forgery in Josephus as well. Yeah, in the testimony in Flavian, but right. nobody really doubts the, the the other part where James is actually listed, where it, where it talks about his martyr. Nobody doubts that that was nobody da nobody sincerely doubts that that wasn't something. Or people accept that this is something that Josephus wrote. Whether or not yeah, that yeah, is, sure. what, holy shit, whether or not that is talking about the same James that is the same brother of the individual mentioned in the Gospels is not clear. Okay. Still, my, my point is that, that they're the best friends and immediate family members of Jesus, right? Like I just pointed out that's not believers. true. Well, you didn't point out that it's not true because it's, so there's external corroboration. It's no, I just pointed out. I just pointed out that the external well, yeah, corroboration. It's calling it an interpolation. I, I just is, that is in the testimony of Flavio. That is not. In it's the like it's of like you won't even listen. I'm trying to listen. I, I'm just no, you're not. I, I don't. You're I, not I, trying I, to listen because when you try to listen, you shut the fuck up. What I'm saying is that when Josephus references James. It is not clear or demonstrable that the individual he's talking to is, in fact, the same James from the Bible. Okay, can I—I I, I didn't want to interrupt you. Can I, can I go now? I don't know. Did you listen? Yeah, no, I, I understand what you're saying. I, okay. I understand that you believe that, okay? And so, so fine, we'll, we'll table James anyway, okay? We'll table James, and, we, and so somebody like Paul would be a good example. So Why? Paul was, as you know, because Paul was, as we both agree, was, I assume you agree that Paul was like, he, he was known to be a violent opposer of Christians and he was 
um, you know, about two years into a campaign to eradicate Christianity when he had an experience that he genuinely believed was an experience with the risen Jesus. And no. So I do not believe. So you don't believe that Paul... I, I'm, I'm a little confused as to what your view is exactly on that matter then. Yeah. Uh, I'm fine with the notion that Paul had an experience that he's relayed um, to the... That he believed was the risen Jesus or no? Possibly, Yeah. Uh, that that's the only thing that seems to make sense. The problem here is that Paul didn't know Jesus, never met him, okay. and cannot be a a witness to the resurrection. Really... Okay, well, I mean, for one, you can't really prove that Paul didn't know Jesus or wasn't in any way familiar with Jesus prior to you know he could have been in Jerusalem during the you, you don't think you don't think you don't think that if Paul had met I, Jesus, shut up, say it one way or the other. Oh, sorry. You don't think that Paul, if he had met Jesus while he was alive, would have would have mentioned this? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, well, that's I a load that of he, crap. He that he that's a load of crap. Boy, what a lot of tap dancing. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Hi, I'm Paul, and I've been persecuting Christians. And the other day, I, I, I used to be called Saul, by the way, but the other day I had this incredible encounter that I'd like to tell you about, which I'm convinced is the risen Jesus who I met in Jerusalem many right. years ago. I saw him preach once. My best bud. Yeah. Anything along those lines. It is, it is more absurd for you to pretend that maybe, maybe not Paul would have mentioned that he met Jesus than it is for you to suggest that sincere religious believers would not lie if they suspected that their salvation was on the line. When we talk about evidential criteria, it is funny to me that we talk about what humans would do. And Matt has this notion that humans who are sincere believers, no true Scotsman fallacy, wouldn't lie about things that would jeopardize their salvation. That there could be no justification for that. That there could be no confusion about salvation. And Paul clearly isn't going to lie. He believed it was a risen Jesus. Now, whether or not he was right or not is subject to question. Wouldn't it be nice if perhaps Paul had known Jesus prior See, because what they want to do, and this is why I, I short-circuit this, what they want to do is say, ah, we have all of this testimony from people who knew Jesus. Really? The Gospels are anonymous. Matt acknowledges that. So we have no idea if the authors knew Jesus or were relaying stories from people who knew Jesus or if there was even a Jesus to know. Oh, well, all right, we'll set that aside and we'll go with Flavium Josephus's, or with Josephus' testimony about James, the, the brother of Jesus. Ah, uh, yeah, there's a problem with that, too. How do you show that that connects? Okay, we'll, we'll toss that out, and now we'll go with Paul. But Paul never met Jesus. But Paul thinks he, he met the risen Jesus. Okay, I know people who thought they photographed Elvis after he was dead. They sincerely believe it. I know people who have believed they've been abducted by aliens. If we're going to talk about epistemology, if we're going to talk about what makes a claim believable, and every time someone engaging in some skepticism and critical thinking points out a flaw in your methodology. If you either jump to something else, some other bit of evidence, and keep going like that, or if you want to suggest that you have a more reasonable account of human behavior, and your more reasonable account is that sincere believers wouldn't lie, you're going to lose. Yeah. <laughs> I've been a sincere believer. I, I, it's human to lie. It is human to invent stories. It is human to want something bigger and better than us and to do whatever it takes to convince people of that. But if you come in saying, hey, I'm convinced that there's good evidence for the resurrection, you better come with more than somebody saw the guy after he was dead 2,000 years ago and I believe him because that ain't enough. I don't know how it could be enough. Well, the irony here is that he's a sincere believer, Matt is, but... He's lying to himself. <laughs> that, well, that, that may be the case. I mean, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to ever assert that anybody is lying because I can't read minds. Until there's a demonstration that they, they've admitted that they knowingly, intentionally deceived. And this is where you get to... Um, well, he's claiming to be a you know stu student of epistemology, but he's not not applying it very well no, to, he, to well, his own beliefs. <laughs> he's, not, he's not a student of epistemology. He called in previously... And didn't know anything about epistemology. Okay. So I recommended he go study up on it. Okay. okay. So in the past couple of weeks, I don't think he thinks he's become an expert. All right. But the, 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 
one of the things that happens is it's, it's a common the die for a lie argument is what apologists will use. Well, all of these apostles and these people who were martyred, they wouldn't die for a lie. Well, first of all, that's not necessarily true. I, I am convinced that there are people who have died for a lie. The only thing that you need to do to get somebody to die for something that they know to not be true is to convince them that something better is going to come out of it. That's it. This is how the mind works. If I can come up with a rationalization, I can rationalize anything. I'm not a violent person. I have no interest in killing someone. But if you could convince me that killing someone would make the world the bestest place in, in, in ever, you might be able to get there. I'd like to think that you couldn't, but I'm fucking human. <laughs> And I know that this is what humans do. I know that this is how they fall behind a leader. I know that this is how the Nazis built up their... They had Gottmaunts on their belt buckles and they're run, running around thinking God is on their side. Uh, I know that this is exactly what people do. Get yourself a bigger lie that diminishes the problem with the other one. And some people might argue, as, as I point out with Andrea Yates, let me drown my kids now so that they're going to go to heaven, even if that damns me to hell. And I would imagine that somewhere in the back of that twisted, perverted mind that led her to do that, not only is some doctrinal things about Christianity, but is the notion, maybe God will see that I loved my children so much I was willing to damn myself for eternity, and he will show mercy on me. He will recognize that this is the exact same love that he did. And if you begin going down that road, you can build up a story such that people will lie over anything. So if you're coming with, I believe in the resurrection because I don't think people would lie, you will make no headway here. <laughs> I don't know. You want to? I'm good. All right. We'll go to Ralph in Florida. You're on with Don and Matt. How are you? Doing great. How are you doing today? Not too bad. Okay. Um, I like uh, the, the biblical Christian debates. Uh, I, I keep up the good work. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. But um, I, I wanted to... Um, I heard before you said no science evidence of God, and I'd like to get into that, if you will, indulge me. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so what is your criteria for evidence? I, I, don't, I don't have or set a criteria for evidence. It's just dependent on the claim. Somebody needs to make a claim, and then we begin evaluating how testable that claim is. The problem, when I say there's no scientific evidence for God, it's because science deals with the natural, and God claims tend to be supernatural. And so science does not even attempt to, to and could not, verify the existence of the supernatural or what the supernatural can do until someone demonstrates a mechanism by which we could do that. And, and so why would scientific you evidence, no you know, evidence? maybe... maybe I still uh, don't understand. Just, just a second. You know, as a scientist, the uh, first thing I would do is maybe do a literature search and see who, who wrote a paper uh, proving the exist, existence of God. Or, you know, it's, it's such a miraculous claim that... Uh, that uh, somebody would win the Nobel Prize for that, right? And, and I don't know of any of that. There, there are certainly findings within science that people look at as evidence for God, but that's not what science does. 99% of the time, what, what about, it is what about is... This? Um, what about um, like a supernatural God versus a natural God? Couldn't you, if there was a natural God, couldn't you actually study that God with science? But not a supernatural God. That's you. That's an like you said. That's I don't. I don't know what an. Claim. I don't know what a natural God is. But if there's something natural, then yes, it's at least plausible that you could investigate it. Okay. Well, that. Are, are you aware of some natural God? I, I believe you know that I have you know faith that uh, the universe is God. I know that Why? may seem absurd. Yes. But um, I, first of all, saying you I have think faith, we can study the universe for yeah. what may be what we could consider God attributes. Well, what what are God attributes? Is, 
Uh, excuse me? What are God attributes that we can find in the universe? Um, well, what would you think would be a God attribute? Do you have any input? I, I'm, I mean, not the, could... I'm not the one that believes in a God. I'm not the one here advocating for a God. You get to tell me okay, what, what, okay. what you okay. believe and why. Okay, well, you know, I think, you know, there are um, synonymous correlations between, for instance, religion and what they teach of a God in some cases. Now, I, I, don't get me wrong. The Bible, I think, is absurd on many levels, talking stakes, that kind of thing. But I think they could have, you know, a, a hypothesis is just a guess, essentially. No. Uh, educated guess okay. or a prediction, if you will. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and, and a hypothesis needs to be what most of all? I would say logical, testable, testable. Yes. So, so give me a, um, give me some characteristic of God that you think is testable that would lead you to the I conclusion that the universe is God. Well, the universe um, is some scientists, prominent scientists now assert that the universe is conscious. And how they come to that conclusion is we are elements of the universe. We are conscious. Therefore, consciousness seems to originate from the universe. Therefore, we are conscious, and therefore, since we are conscious, the universe, some aspect of it, is conscious through us. Does that mean my pinky is conscious? No, your pinky is not your brain. Would the sun be conscious? No. Okay. So the parts of something, what the parts of something can do, are independent from what the whole can do, and what the whole can do is independent from what the parts can do. So this consciousness by way of analogy is really kind of a metaphor. When, it, when somebody says the universe is conscious because we're conscious, all they mean is there's consciousness in the universe, not that the universe itself is conscious. And the, and the demonstration of that is if every conscious being died and the rest of the universe remained, would the universe be considered conscious then? Um, I would say not. Me, uh, me too. Think about it this way: if you cut your pinky off, you're 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 still you, you know. So yeah, but I'm not the same me that I was before the pinky. What happens is when I cut my pinky off, I redefine me as what I was before minus a pinky. Yeah. And so if we re if we redefine if if I cut my head off then we can redefine me as what I was before minus consciousness, and which you've already acknowledged by suggesting that if every, every conscious being ceased to exist, the universe would no longer be considered conscious. Okay. Well, also, it, it seems to me, you know, it, it seems to me, Ralph, that you're, you, you're, you're, you're kind of enamored with the notion that there could be a God, there might be a God, is there some way for God? Why, why, is, why is there this desperate thing to try to find something that you don't have any good reason to think he is even real. Like, why, why aren't you arguing on behalf of pixies? I mean, I think pixies would be fun based on the, the, the descriptions of them in fantasy novels. That Some of them, maybe not as much. Some of them may be cantankerous or whatever. But, but there are things in fantasy novels that I like and appreciate. There are things in science fiction stories I like. I'd like for Warp Drive to be real. And I'd like for us to maybe kind of investigate that. But if it turns out everything that we find shows that there's no good reason to think this is that faster than light travel is possible. Um, why would we then redefine faster than light to be like, well, if you think about it, we're seeing light from stars from a long time ago right now. And so that's kind of a little bit like time travel. And so I'm going to say that time travel is possible. And since time travel, since motion is relative, maybe we're actually traveling faster than light in a metaphorical sense. You know, I'm not claiming any kind of certainty, you know, as far as... I'm more agnostic, I would say, but uh, for, and for most of my life, I was 100% agnostic, undecided. But I just, I, you know, I, I'm with Kaku. Kaku said that he thinks there's wisdom in the God of Einstein, 
And I, you know, I, I do look up to him. Some say that uh, it's appeal to authority, but I believe Einstein was an authority on the universe. Tesla said he believed there is a core, and his mind is a receiver to that core. I would say that core he spoke of may well be God. I don't know. I, all of this is metaphor and flowery language. Um, I I don't see anything scientific here. What difference so does it What difference does it make what any of those people s said? What matters is what they can well, prove. You know, I guess you could say those would be my prophets. I look up to genius level and, scientists and philosophers. Okay. Um, why? Why not? I mean, they definitely had a lot of insight into a great many things. Sure, why? but if I'm really good at one thing, does that mean I'm really good at something else? Well, would you, you'd rather, I guess, I study under Jesus? Is that what you're saying? No, I, I'm saying you're looking to Michio Kaku, you're looking to Einstein. Um, yeah, have they demonstrated any... IQ. Uh, so IQ doesn't matter. IQ is a measure of how good you are at taking IQ tests. I, I, I have a, a, a really nice IQ number that I couldn't care less about. Um, yeah, I got you. It, yeah, I agree. I agree but, with much but it, of does, what you But does said Kaku or well. Einstein or any of these guys, have they demonstrated some expertise with regard to understanding or knowledge of gods? Well, if their God is the universe, yes, because no, that's no, what no. they were expert in, <laughs> okay. in the study of the universe. If, I am, if I'm an expert auto mechanic, does that mean that you should call me to fix your plumbing? Well, we're not talking about Hang on. plumbing. We're that was a simple question. That was a simple question. No. What if, I, what if I tell you that your plumbing is actually a car? Yeah, but... It, it, yeah, but nothing. Calling the universe God in order to take your, t take your legitimate understanding of the universe and then move it into a different category is you're dishonest. The wrong metaphor here. Uh, the metaphor would be the universe, and uh, Einstein was an expert on the universe. He wasn't an expert on plumbing. So I wouldn't seek him for plumbing advice. Sure. But so so Einstein's an expert yeah. on the universe. Einstein's an expert in the universe, and I'm an expert on auto mechanics. And so Einstein, first of all, doesn't say the universe is God. He was talking about Spinoza's God, and he was. It, it's entirely metaphorical. But if, if Einstein were to say the universe is God, that would be like me saying this car is your plumbing, or that I can fix your plumbing, or tell you about plumbing, because there are hoses around my engine that transport water, and then there's heat transfer and fluid flow issues related to a radiator, and that this is somehow similar to your garbage disposal. I just don't think that metaphor fits like you're thinking it fits. But okay, <laughs> and, it, and it may not. You don't think your metaphor And fits. it may not, but at the end of the day, why are you taking the people's thoughts about, that are, that are science-based about the universe? And then expanding that to a metaphor about God and then trying to make claims about God. It just seems like a more logical approach than, like I said, for Christianity, for example. Oh, I, I know. I, congratulations. <laughs> you, you've, come up, you've come up with something more reasonable than something that is unreasonable. The point isn't but to say, the point is not to say, no that, the point is not, Ralph. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The point is not to say I'm more reasonable than the village idiot. The point is to demonstrate that your position is actually reasonable enough to be accepted as likely true. Well, I don't see why it wouldn't be. It seems plausible to me. Okay. I, I suggest you maybe just drop the whole God thing and stick to claims about the universe that are provable and testable. And Why not drop the universe thing and read Because the universe the exists universe. and we don't know if God exists. Because the universe is here, yeah. I can, I can touch the universe. <laughs> well, I mean... It, walking it, up and down in it. Everything originates from the universe. It's a fact. What, what originates from the universe? We did, consciousness did, everything. Sure, we're part does. of the universe. So would you say consciousness 
with, there's there's different arguments on consciousness. We could get into that. I've read a no, lot we about can't. it. Yeah. You're not going to get to God from there. But that's a hard problem. Yes. Dawkins has said that's the hard problem of consciousness. Okay, there's a, there's no, a lot stop. of things we don't know, just, a lot of things we're studying. So what? It, <laughs> But I'm just saying, to be certain, there's no God. Is nobody is nobody saying that. Have either of us said we are certain there is no God? You seem very confident that there's I, no I'm God. I'm confident that I have not been presented with any compelling arguments for a God, but have I ever said I am certain there is no God? As no, a matter of fact, have not. haven't I also said that I'm not absolutely certain about anything? Haven't I said that like a gazillion fucking times? Yes, you're an agnostic ape. Goodbye. If you know that my position, and then Don's may not be the same, but if you know that my position is that I don't think you can be absolutely certain about anything, how dare you call in and suggest and say that it just seems unreasonable for you to be certain there is no God. Oh, I don't know why I did a different accent. My, my ex-wife will smack me for that because uh, <laughs> it's accent shaming to, to take the southern accent and make it I, sound stupid. Well, I th we're, we're, we're certain that the evidence is paltry, that, that certainly that, that we've been presented with. I'm certainly and confident We've been asking that. for it for years. Yeah. <laughs> and it's nothing new. Nothing new. Yeah. Uh, here we go. We'll, we'll go with Ryan in Florida. Maybe, maybe, Ryan, you're on with Don and Matt. Maybe you can get us closer uh, because you say you can come to God through skepticism. Oh, uh, yes, that's correct. What do you mean by skepticism? Well, I mean, fundamentally, questioning ideas, critically thinking about things. I used to subscribe to the idea that it was completely logical to believe things that you can prove through empirical facts. And, I, you know, I was an atheist my whole life until about three years ago. Okay. So, and, so skepticism is essentially a desire to hold as many true beliefs and as few false beliefs as possible and use the methods that make that most probable to reserve and withhold belief until such time as the evidence compels it. That's skepticism. Is that the same you're talking about? Well, I haven't heard that definition before. Uh, okay, I can, well... I can roll with that. That's sure. And, and under that, what it means is that somewhere around three years ago, you've basically found sufficient evidence to justify belief in a particular God claim, right? Um, yes. Yes and no. Well, uh, no, 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 no. You can't have a yes and a no. I, I mean, I, I get that it's probably more complicated like than that, but it would help if you told us what God you believe in and why. More importantly, why should we believe? God of eight. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you what I believe in. I believe that there's one God, the God of Abraham, the God that created the universe, and his son, Jesus Christ. Okay. And, so, okay. Why? So I had to, when I, when I was an atheist, I slowly realized that there were lots of things that I believed that I couldn't prove. There were lots of things that I was uncritically taught in public schools and in my secular upbringing that once I heard a little bit of scrutiny put to them, I realized that they were not any more logical than creationism. Okay, so for, I see creationism hey, as I need to pause for just a second. Hypothesis. I need I need to pause for a second because when you say they were not as logical, um, I'm not completely sure what you mean, and when people use language like that, it makes me feel like they learned logic on Star Trek. So All right. what, All what, right. what we need is what... So you, basically you said you came to understand that there were things that you believed without good reason. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's true for everything. I mean, that's true for everyone. There are plenty of things that we believe without good reason. Why is it mm -hmm. that believing some things without good reason would lead you to accept something else without good reason. I'm not saying you did. I'm saying that for me, when I find out I believe things without good reason, I stop believing those things. And I'm not going to believe new things on bad reasons. I want good reasons to believe something. 
that's okay. skepticism. Right. So what good reason do you have I, to believe in, in, the, in the God of Abraham, the God of the Bible? <clears throat> okay. This went a little bit direct, a bit of a direction that I wasn't prepared for. So if you excuse me, let me collect my thoughts for a sec. Um, well, what I like about the church that I'm trying to become a part of is that it's based around what we don't know. I don't know everything about the universe, and I and I think the church, in a lot of ways, is more honest about our understanding of the universe, since they're willing to admit what we don't know. I uh, science claims they don't know science. all sorts of things, and they go investigate, right? Science doesn't make proclamations of but, truth. Science doesn't make appeals to absolute certainty. Science isn't remotely dogmatic. What make, what church? Well, I'm sorry. What church, and I don't care whether you like it, I mean, I, I'm asking for argument and evidence. Mm -hmm. What church are you trying to, to join that uh, talks about what it doesn't know? Eastern Orthodoxy. Okay. So I want to I wanna back up a second here. So you said science doesn't believe in empirical truth and reality? It doesn't make any claims of truth? Science doesn't make truth claims. Science provides... Really? Yes, really. Science provides models that are the best explanation of the current available evidence. Those models are subject to testing and subject to revision so that when we find new information, we actually modify what the scientific model is. These are not proclamations of truth or certainty at all. These are our best understanding of all of the available information. It is the most intellectually honest and most intellectually rigorous process that I'm aware of. Do you believe that life can come from non-life? I, well, at some point in the universe, all the evidence points to the fact that there wasn't life, and now there is. Mm -hmm. So I would have to reach the conclusion that, yes, there is some way that life can come from a place of non-life. How or why it ha how it happens, I don't know. So there's not much evidence to suggest that that's the case. There's, right? wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Once upon a time, does all the available evidence, best evidence about the universe, suggest that at one time there was not life? Uh, I wouldn't say that necessarily. You, you wouldn't. So 13.5 billion years ago, when, mm -hmm. when, you know, the best scientific evidence shows that we didn't even have uh, many of the molecules that were on the periodic table. You think there was life? I don't, I don't know if that's exactly proven how old the universe is. From what I understand, that number keeps changing all the time. It, it, oh no! Then science has revised itself. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the age of it the universe must be has been terribly wrong has all been, the time. Has been revised. Yes, as we got <laughs> new and better information. How old do you think the universe is? I don't know. Okay. I think that's a more honest. Uh, I think that's a more honest. But but when you say I don't I know, don't know, do you absolutely have zero idea? I mean, is the universe more than five minutes old? I believe it's more, it's older than Abraham and Moses and oh. and all that. Okay. Is it older than uh, 20,000 years? Why is it we can't get a straight answer from you? <laughs> I asked if you thought the universe was well, older well, than how, five how, minutes. It's a simple well, question, yeah. right? I mean, I said yes. No, you didn't. You didn't well, actually I, say yes. Abraham, if you if you rewind Abraham this, no, no, no. Five minutes ago. Okay, come on. Give me a break. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm going to give you a break. I promise you. Is the universe older than 25,000 years? I don't know. I'm not sure. Do you think that the bulk of available science and scientists who have studied the universe's age would support the conclusion that the universe is more than 100,000 years old. I am aware that that is generally the accepted conclusion that most scientists have made, yes. Okay. And, and so you're aware that of the experts, 
who assess the evidence and of the models that are created from the evidence that have been subjected to peer review and revision, which are available to everyone, that the dating of the universe is far closer to 13.7 billion years than it is to six to 10,000 yeah. years. Sure. I, I mean, I'm entirely willing to accept that the Bible's probably wrong about the age of the universe. But the Bible doesn't say anything about the age of the universe. That's man interpreting things and going back and adding up dates with an assumption that on day what, four, five, six, whatever, uh, that these were literal days. The Bible doesn't say the universe is six to 10,000 years old. That's what some man said based on, that, which is why not all Christians are young earth creationists. There's also day age creationists. There's also old earth creationists. There's people who view it as metaphor. I'm talking about what the science says. Right. And so if the science shows yeah. that the universe is 13.7 billion years old, give or take, then isn't isn't that the best finding of science? And wouldn't you have to then show that it would be wrong in order to fundamentally change that paradigm? As a skeptic. Well, <clears throat> I'm not going to pretend that I fully understand all of the research that went into that. What I do know is that there doesn't seem to be that much of a consensus on this point, and it seems to change a lot. And, I mean, I, I don't see how, if the universe is that old, how that disproves God. You, you, you like seem to be a subject of indoctrination. They seem to have convinced you that, that you can't know anything, and therefore they're going to plant their seeds uh, of whatever bullshit they're selling in your head. That's, that's what I'm getting out of this. But you also <laughs> just said that I don't see, you know, you also just said I don't see how it disproves God. Did I say it disproves God? No. So well, stop okay. pretending that people are making claims that they're not fucking making. Now, the point that I was trying to get to for the last five minutes or so is at some point, yes. at some point, under all models of the universe, including young Earth creationism, the universe existed and there was not life. Correct? Uh, yes. God, why couldn't I get that? Yes, five minutes ago. And at some point now... There is life, correct? Yes. Which means under all models, life came from non-life, correct? Well, God is life. That's what my church believes. God is life. God created life. You just acknowledged that at some point in the universe, there was not life. Mm, but God is okay. outside the universe. My mistake. I, I'm back <laughs> up. I did not mean to say that. Okay. Then prove that at that at no point in prove that at no point in the history of the universe was there no life. I can't prove it. Good. Then why do you believe it? I can't prove it. Why do you believe it? I I choose to believe it. I have. Faith. You don't choose to believe anything. I, you, belief isn't subject to a choice. Of course you do. No, no, you don't. You you have become convinced for some reason. What is the reason? I've had personal experiences. That's that, not convincing to us, though. Cool. <laughs> no, I understand. Lots of people have personal experiences. I, I get it. But at least now we're getting closer to, to an actual honest answer. So you've had some experience I, that you can't reconcile with scientific... I, I prayed, under I, yeah. I prayed to a God I didn't believe in when I thought I was dying once. Okay. And you know what happened when I prayed? Nothing. Absolutely nothing happened. Okay. So I thought, well, so I thought, well, you know, that was a waste of time. I won't do that again. And then a few years later, well, it happened again. And I prayed, and this time, something changed. I don't know what. I don't know what happened. Okay. I begged God. I said, let me live. I'll start going to church. You know, I'll start. <laughs> and I mean, it's silly. I don't know any, I didn't know anything about this okay. at the time. And, Ryan. I think that uh, was a very immature way of looking at it. From Ryan. Point of view. Uh -huh. Ryan, so let me, let me exercise a little skepticism that might teach you something about skepticism. You just talked about two different times where you were going to die or thought you were going to die. And the first time you prayed to a God you didn't believe in and nothing happened. And the second time you mm -hmm. prayed to a God that, that you didn't believe in, something happened. But the truth is you lived through both of those. Of course. 
Why would you well, credit the what, second one? Been, why would you credit the second that. time? Why would you credit the second time to a god and not the first time to a god? This is called a well, post hoc I mean, rationalization. First one to a god. What's that? Well, according, according to uh, the medical science, I was having panic attacks and I wasn't actually going to die anyways. But... It's funny that you didn't die about. and science tells you why and yet you're sitting here pooping all over science because something... What changed, Ryan, in that second experience where you prayed to God, what changed? I, I realized that there was something inside of me that needed God, that there was something that I was missing in my life that I couldn't put my finger on, that there was nothing in the world that would satisfy me because we live in a fallen state. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Okay, I'm not interested in, in religious platitudes. What was it within you that you think needed God and how do you know that that's accurate? I know it's accurate because just about every group of human beings on the planet believe in some sort of God. You know, I'm sure there's exceptions. I'm sure there's plenty of exceptions. Okay. There are... But it's there a are, universal there, human idea. Okay. It's, it's, there have been a lot of Why? seemingly near universal human ideas that we don't think are correct. Sure. So the question I asked, though, was... What is it within you that you thought needed God, and how do you know that that's true, real? Well, I needed salvation. You know, I need salvation. From what to what by whom? From death. God you need salvation from death. Yes. God is life. He created man with... So you're, you're telling me what you believe... And none of that gets, none of that is, is something that you can demonstrate is true. Every time I get to this of what did you need and why, you just keep going back to religious stories and platitudes. So everybody is going to die. Do we agree on that? Yeah. Okay. So how can you be saved from death and how do you know that that's true? Because God sent his son Jesus to prove to us how do you know? The plan of God, which is to resurrect all human beings and to have everlasting life. How do you know? That's a story. How do you know it's true? I, I don't know it's true. I choose to believe it's true. I have faith okay. that it is true. I, I someone someone has true. convinced you somehow, some experience, some individual has convinced you that this is the case. You don't simply decide, you know, like, hey, today I'm going to no, believe that Muhammad is the one and only prophet of God. You don't decide those well, beliefs. You become convinced. Well, so did you... I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me. So did you, did you come to your beliefs in a vacuum? Was there no one who influenced you? No, there were plenty of people who influenced me. I'm not talking about influence. I'm talking about beliefs are the result of becoming convinced. For, the long, for a period of my life, I used to, well, it used to be more than half, but now it's not because I'm old. For a long time, mm -hmm. I was a fundamentalist Southern Baptist Christian. I believed in many of the things that you're talking about. Now I don't believe mm -hmm. those things because I realized mm -hmm. I did not have good reasons to believe them. And much like you, when I found that I didn't have good reasons for believing things, I had no choice but to stop believing them. I could not remain convinced once I spotted the fallacies, once I spotted the bad arguments, mm -hmm. once I spotted the dearth yeah. of evidence to support it. All right, that's, that's great. What you're describing right now is almost the mirror image of my life. I grew up secular in public schools, uncritically taught that evolution is how, you know, all species originated and that, you know, the Big Bang Theory is what created the universe, which is a Catholic idea, by the way, which I don't subscribe to. <laughs> and once I started hearing good arguments about this, I came to the conclusion that I think God makes more sense. Because it explains everything? No. No. Because it's honest enough to admit 
that it doesn't know everything. No, that's that's a load of shit. God is claiming to know absolutely everything. And the people who are claiming that there is a God are pretending that there is an answer for absolutely everything and that they have access to it. N not in this life. What other life is there? You have no reason to think there's any life other than this one. Well, how about all the people who died? We were talking about this earlier. You were talking about this earlier. Really. All people who died knowing they were going to another life. They didn't die knowing. They died believing. The fact that you are convinced of something doesn't okay. mean you know it and doesn't mean that it's true. People are convinced of all kinds of things. Wait, I'm sorry. Can you explain the difference between knowing and believing to me? Believing is being convinced that it's true. Knowledge is a subset of belief, and while philosophy tends to define it as, for example, justified true belief, that it is justified true, I think there are problems with that. Generally saying to know something is to believe something to such a high degree of confidence that it would be worldview altering to think, to discover that it was wrong. Right, so, so knowing is a truth claim, right? Which you were saying earlier that... Well, they're both claims, and that, claims. so I, I think the distinction between these two things doesn't matter that much. Yeah. Beliefs are in your head. It, right, it, they're not—they're not objective facts about the. <laughs> they're not telling you what the, what's true. Is, is it possible for somebody to think? Is it possible for somebody to believe something and be wrong? Of course, of course. That's all I'm saying is that there are people who believe uh -huh. something. Now, if you believe something, are you aware that you're wrong? If you believe something, mm, uh, no, no. So if you're if you believe something and you're wrong. Doesn't that feel exactly like believing something and, you, and being right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, from, from that person's subjective experience, it's identical. This is why it, you, people talk about what it feels like to be wrong. Um, it's not that. Mm -hmm. It's about discovering that you were, in fact, wrong. And once you have become uh, convinced yeah, by I the way to evidence... Being that, wrong. Once I you become... Being proven wrong. Once I want I want to go back to the earlier conversation we were having with the last caller about why all dying on the cross. No, you were saying no. You were saying no, people, Ryan. Be willing to die for Ryan. Life. No, we're not going back to that. We're dealing with this now. Oh, okay. Now, okay. Well, I think that's you, important. You were talking about how you were taught a certain way in school, and that you were expected yes. to accept things uncritically. I will fully acknowledge right. that school systems suck. And that we are teaching people the wrong way to go about things. But the things that you seem to dismiss now are science. Like you talked about, you're not sure about the age of the earth. You don't have any expertise there. You talked about how you were taught that evolution is the explanation for the diversity of life on the planet. It is yes. the, the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. It is the cornerstone of biology that is the best current description of the diversity of life on the planet. This is... I think there's some serious holes in it. So what? Would you like to talk about that? I would like to talk about that. Where's your Nobel Prize? <laughs> the, Where's your scientific the, paper the fact, pointing them out? The fact that a scientific well, model is incomplete or that a Luddite with no understanding of the science thinks there's holes in it is irrelevant. The experts... Excuse me. Excuse me. You don't, you don't need to add a hominem me and call me a Luddite. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be are, bringing this up if are, I didn't think I could make a good case. Are you willing to hear it, or you want to move on to something else? The, the fact that you think you can make a good case is independent from whether or not you can make a good case. Do you have any, okay, well, me, do you have any expertise in biology? Are you going to let me try? Do you have any expertise well, in biology? It's a problem for you to, to dismiss my arguments. Do you have any expertise in biology? No. Do you? No. And so why would we spend time on something that's ultimately irrelevant as to whether or not there's a God when neither of us have any expertise? You're making an argument from authority. You're making an argument from authority. No, I'm not. I'll tell you what. Present your argument, and if we find the flaw in it, will you promise to, uh, to uh, start studying and, and actually applying skepticism to your beliefs? Sure. Thank you. So evolution, as I understand it, yes, as a layman... It's the idea that there are genes going back to the first single cell on Earth, and it, uh, it reproduced, and over a long period of time, the genes that produced successful reproductive selection lived on. So we went from a single cell to all the diversity on the planet. Is this correct? 
No. Okay. Where am I wrong? Well, it's somewhat sloppy in the sense that okay. we have... I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm being brief about this. So your understanding of how evolution works in the model by natural selection, it's not about the ones that were necessarily best at surviving. It is probably better viewed as evolution selects against certain traits. And that way there are negative traits that persist as well, as long as they're not sufficiently negative to keep something from reproducing. But that doesn't begin with, hey, there was a single cell that necessarily led to everything. What you get initially is self-replicating molecules, as best we can tell, mm -hmm. which would be something like RNA, DNA. And that process right. copies and sometimes there are errors in the copies. And sometimes those errors are sufficient for the organism to not be able to reproduce and pass on as genes. And sometimes those errors actually result in something that may be beneficial. Okay. All right. I'll accept that. So, but I mean, the general consensus usually is that the first life on Earth started in the oceans. No. That, do you believe that? No. no? Okay. Okay, this is we've gotten off the topic of evolution. Why why is evolution wrong? Okay, picture something that does not have a wing. Some sort of organism does not have a wing. Now think about the level of steps required for an organism. To Char not Charles wing. Darwin go from discussed this issue in his in his book. As has every modern biologist. How many steps do you think you need to take and how much time do you need to take to get to a wing? Have you ever seen a My flying question, squirrel or a flying fish? What advantage, excuse me, what, what fundamental sexual advantage would it be to have a non-functioning wing? Right, like this so, is something that takes place over one generation. It's got to be multiple, multiple, many. Yeah, this is this is the thing that thousands of years. This is this is this, this is the thing that exactly you didn't the topic pay attention. That's discussed in these books. <laughs> this is the thing that you didn't pay attention to. It's not what benefit would there be to have half a wing. It's not like, oh, we grew a feather. It's is the change that allows, for example, a flap of skin on a squirrel to allow it to float gradually down, is that sufficiently negative to prevent it from reproducing? As long as it's not sufficiently negative, it will continue to pass on that genetic, th that genetic aspect. And over time, that can change into something that ends up having a use well, like sure i mean if you want to reframe it to something as simple as a flap of skin i i can buy that i believe in adaptation a squirrel is still a squirrel i don't think that there's any proof that a squirrel can become something that isn't a squirrel right i don't think it's possible for a squirrel to you do not understand evolution years, 100 billion years you you do not understand evolution and you're, you're sitting here talking about, I don't think that there's enough time to do this. Do you have any expertise in the field at all? Have you bothered to study it? Because the people who you know do... How old the universe the people, <laughs> you don't even know how old the universe is. You don't, the people who have actually studied this, and you can go read their work, will make the case. All you're doing is sitting there sticking your fingers in your ears and saying, nah, -uh, I don't think there was enough time. Well, who gives a shit whether you think there was enough time? No, I don't think it's an issue of time necessarily. I think it's an issue that it's just not possible. So explain to me how. So you've de you've decided, you've decided, coming out, you've decided, you've decided as a skeptic that evolution is not possible. How the fuck did you do that? <laughs> well, you don't believe that. I mean, you believe tons of things aren't possible, right? No. You believe anything is possible? No. I believe that possibility needs to be demonstrated and that impossibility needs to be demonstrated. Right. And when neither have been demonstrated, then you're in a position... Shut up. When, you're, when neither has been demonstrated, you are in a position where the only reasonable answer is that you don't know if it's possible or impossible. Now, how did you determine that evolution isn't possible? Present your work. Well, I <laughs> prove that it is. You can't prove that it is possible. It's never been observed. You're, you're, ma you're the one making the claim. <laughs> uh, no, evolution is the claim. Evolution no, evolution the claim. by, th by th no, means of natural you're, you're selection claiming. is the model. 
evolution is an observed fact. It's a change in allele frequencies over time. You need a proven negative now. Yes, and you can prove you negative. You offered to do so. You, you can prove a negative. <laughs> you offered to prove that evolution was wrong. You know what I'm saying. And, and we yeah, gave you a chance, prove a negative. and now you're spinning spinning around. Well, let's, let's move on. You can, you can prove a negative, Ryan. You should go look that up next. You should look up evolution. You should look up how you can actually prove a negative because you're confusing a negative to prove something is not the case with a universal negative. You, you, uh, all right. We are, we are over time, but if you're on the line, stay on and we'll try to get to you uh, afterwards because we just broke the all-time live viewing record today. So, hey, Ken, you're on with uh, Matt and Don. Hi, Matt and Don. How are you? Hey. Hey, just wanted to, uh, real quick, just wanted to say thanks for all you guys do. You know, I think a lot of people don't realize the time and effort that's involved and putting on a show, organizing it, having phones ready, getting callers lined up. I, I only reason, uh, so I, I realize, thank you. I think given the call, what the call screener wrote, your question is going to be a really good way to end this for the day. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, for me, I had a long journey, uh, probably similar to yours, except I was in many denominations. And <clears throat> had a lot of questions was usually giving, given really bad answers, like, you know, where did the dinosaur bones come from? Satan. You know, God put them, you know, God put them in the ground to test us. Mm -hmm. I mean, on and on, and I think you know a lot of that. And uh, since I've gone on this journey, you know, lost a lot of friends, and but have been a lot more free than I've ever been. Also a lot happier. Also, I feel probably... Uh, easier to be a better person, not having this feeling like someone's watching over me, uh, like my thoughts are being monitored. <laughs> I actually find it just incredibly, incredibly freeing. I mean, it is, it has its own reward. Yes. The loss, however, is a lot of friends. Um, you know, I, I grew up really tightly in a little tight uh, knit group of friends in a youth group that was very good for its time. Um, but as I began to express myself more and more, um, you know, it's not like they want to disown you, but you suddenly don't get invited for dinner as much. You suddenly are not in the loop and you kind of see the writing on the wall. Well, um, you know, you just need to make, that, make new friends. That's, that, uh, that and, I, should... and I have, and I absolutely have. It's just, it's hard to see lifelong friends go down, uh, dwindle down to nothing or almost nothing or kind of disowned. And that gets kind of frustrating. But I guess, they're, you know, getting to the point of what I called, you know, I have gotten to the point where I've become so much more educated about where our Bible came from, how the Old Testament has been manipulated to fit the narrative. And I have gone on campaigns being very anti-theist, to quote the uh, you know, the late uh, Christopher Hitchens. Yeah. And I really beat the snot out of people with really good information. And I feel like I don't have one single person that has ever said, wow, you're right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it gets, it, I mean, I have devoted a lot of time to this. I, I, uh, I spend an incredible amount of time debating online, um, you know, in debates with people that I meet in a coffee shop what have you. And I just feel like I wonder why I'm doing it. And I also have to wonder how do you guys have the drive to be doing this for as many years as you have? I mean, I find it incredible. I, I actually have watched so many of your episodes, uh, mostly for entertainment. I mean, I think, I think my favorite one was when you had a woman call in who you asked eventually to get to the point. She, you said, would you be my slave under these conditions and she said yes and you got up and walked out of the studio i mean <laughs> to me i fell off the sofa when i when i watched that i mean it was just so hilarious so i, I know it's i know it's frustrating but here's the easy answer I, okay you're gonna have far more failures than you will successes um there are probably people who are going to be forever impervious to reasoned argument and evidence the problem is is that i can't tell who those people are 
even after I've talked to them. Because for some people, maybe it's not going to happen the first time, or maybe it's not going to happen in a conversation with me, or maybe it's not going to happen in a conversation with Don or you. But I can't tell you whether or not they're going to change their mind later. And so the only thing to do is to keep doing it because I'm convinced that not doing it will, in fact, lead to a worse life. Yeah, and be satisfied with planting seeds. Well, you know, I was going to say that, and I and I think to myself, how ironic that when I first learned about the idea of planting seeds, <laughs> compared yeah. to why, the way I want to plant seeds now, but, is just like... The, but we know that people perfect. change their mind. We know that I, I'm living, walking, talking proof that people change their mind over these subjects. And we hear from thousands of people over the years that have done this that they've changed their mind as well. We know that happens. And in the absence of people actually doing this kind of work... It's less likely to happen. I mean, you, if you're going for atheist normalcy and you're going for uh, encouraging secular thought and, and an abandonment of religion in the world, I don't know how else you can do that other than to get out and do the work. Yeah. And, and I know, but, you know, but my question comes in ultimately, you know, I left because I had real subtle questions that were never answered. And I, always, I was always a bit of a skeptic. I was a good student. You know, I was a national quiz champion, and I find, like, you know, I know the Bible really well, as I hear you often do. I'm pretty sure you know it better than me. But now I use that in defense of my position. But most of the people that I talk to have kind of made this journey almost on their own. Like, I, uh, Seth Andrews, who I know is a good friend of yours, you know, he talked about when he was, I think it was after 9-11, he was on the radio and he kind of went into this prayer mode, let's pray for these people. And he, he kind of had this uh, epiphany that came upon him. You know, and, and for me, the, I don't want to get into all that. I know we don't have time for it. It was real subtle. And I know different people. I think I've heard a little bit of yours. Yeah, but and, and here's the thing, it, Ken, about. it could be, it, you could easily look at my journey and say, oh, well, you did it on your own. Um, and that's true. I didn't really have any discussions with somebody actively. But in the, in the process of searching for information, uh, of, of studying this and asking questions myself, I had the benefit of David Hume and Voltaire and infidels.org and tons of people who had done this beforehand. Just the fact that we're doing it in a kind of a talk show environment or that you might be doing it one-on-one -on -one is just a different way. Nobody does anything truly on their own. We are the beneficiaries of just tons of information and everybody who's walked the planet before us, who's done something that we can investigate and contribute. If nobody had done the work, if Madeline, uh, Madeline Murray O'Hara hadn't d done the work that she did, if Frank Zindler hadn't done the work that he did, I could not have gotten to where I am now uh, without vastly more work. But, but let me let me uh, push back a little bit. You 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 and everybody else who leaves uh, theism has to put their own work into it, and and there is a process there, and often that process is five to ten years of of work and study and and these sorts of things, and that's why you don't get the 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 callers on our show, you know, converting. Hail Mary! You know, I see, I see the light now. Uh, we don't, we don't get that. Um, it's a process, and and uh, you know, the planting seeds thing is the best you can do. Often, uh, you know, put some nagging doubts in people's minds and let them fester there, and maybe you'll get a nice oyster at the end of the day. And on that note, Ken, I'm sorry, but we're way over time, and we've got to go. Uh, I, I appreciate the call and the time. Hopefully, just if you find yourself getting frustrated, take a break. And find yourself, yeah, you know, I think that's what they need to do. yeah. Find find a community. That's the reason the atheist community of Austin exists is for people to hang out so that they're not always being uh, feeling alone or ostracized by religious uh, family members and friends and stuff like that. But we are the evidence, the data show that we are being successful. That the nuns are the one of the fastest growing religious identities uh, in the Western world. Um, the success of this show and others and meeting people like I could do a show of hands in there and I'm going to bet before anybody raises their hands that the overwhelming majority of people on the other side of the glass were once religious and that some portion of the 25 people or so that are in that room uh, 
are no longer religious in part because of either this show or conversations like that. Raise your hand if that's true. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. <laughs> See? That's it's yeah. easy to get okay. discouraged, especially when you're having one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's one of the reasons why I don't have as many one-on-one -on -one conversations about this stuff as I used to, because it's far better with an audience. The, the person that I was talking to may never change their mind, but somebody else out there believes exactly the same thing. And because they weren't under the, under the gun on the phone with the pressure to, to, perform. to perform and defend that, they are now freer to reevaluate their views. And so have an audience when you can. Well, it just it amazes me too. What I guess what the biggest frustration is having so much knowledge about the Bible, its origins, the the things I didn't know, like the fact that the Gospels weren't actually written by apostles or disciples. You know, and that you have so much more information, and yet these friends of mine who I've if if I could be arrested for verbal assault, I would have been in jail a long time ago. I mean, you know, it's funny because I hear you go off with people and like, why does Matt do that? And then I do the same thing. Yeah, so. and it's it's not something that, that I enjoy doing, no matter how many people like to see a clip like that, but mm -hmm. the conversations are frustrating. Humor can be a lot more productive sometimes. Yeah. On that yeah, note, I know. I'd give you the last yeah. word, but I'm going to hang up on you because it's funny. <laughs> oh, that's mean, Matt. I know, that's but mean. Ken will laugh at that. That's mean. I, I have confidence <laughs> that Ken will laugh. <laughs> On that note, uh, thanks everybody who's here and who hung around. We're going to take some questions. We're going to take the last couple callers offline after the show and uh, hit the Discord real quick. On the other side of that wall where I'm pointing my finger, there's the people who make this show happen. Yay! They, they heart you. 6,235 live viewers today, which is going to be uh, a new record for Atheist Experience uh, that, since we've been tracking anyway. Yeah. And so, cool. Thanks everybody for hanging out. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. What are we doing, man? What are we doing? No, 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 no. No, you're done.